yeah yeah okay so okay so see these are the requirements what i am going with okay very simple ones and we can again revisit so what i'm trying to do is uh, first the user will try to register for a competition that will be the first requirement and second user submits his code for a particular question so, so, so there will be submission against each and every question and then the user fetches a leaderboard so to view all the scores and the third user has the ability to read the history also of different challenges whatever happened so these are the four and out of that i think we should, we, we might be able to cover the first three okay or possible then we go for the fourth also so any any questions on the function requirement if you want to cover is something the, is else the history is the history of a challenge or the history of a user yeah that's a good question so it can be a history of a user because that will be more important for us right as a user we should know only our history isn't okay. it okay yeah so that is what i'm thinking but yeah we we can actually discuss on that front later maybe and this fetching the leaderboard so, will be after the competition right leaderboard yes uh, because yeah. Uh, yeah. when everyone is done then we should have that correct Hmm. So I think lead Almost, code. Basically, yeah, uh, most of the judges have a live leaderboard. Yeah, they have live. Uh, lead, lead, yeah, lead code also has it, right? Immediately it shows. Lead code enables it after ten minutes, actually. Like for the first ten minutes, I think you can't see it, but after that, you can start seeing. Mm -hmm. Okay. So basically, whenever the submission starts, so I know people start submitting very fast. So. Uh -huh. I think that might be uh like that's an interesting thing because that can affect the design pretty uh, i mean uh, significantly right if you're having periodically refreshes of your leaderboard then you mm -hmm. have to fetch the data analytics and all that mm -hmm. but uh, we may take it step by step right mm -hmm. yeah, yeah maybe yeah i didn't think yeah. on that really fine <laughs> okay that's a good thing so yeah then we discuss about these non functional requirements high availability low latency high reliability and okay so these are a few apis um, what i thought they might be a good thing to start with uh, one is uh, as as i said like we'll go for the first thing about user registration so user will have do a registration he will have his user id and the competition id or the challenge id whatever it is you can call it second will be a submission of code with the user id question id and whatever language is choosing and the code text all right so this will be the code text what you're going to submit and third will be just getting a history based on the user id and then uh, fourth is about fetch leaderboard based on the challenge id so for each challenge you will be able to get this uh, fetch leaderboard and the third will be get the last successful submission so whatever you have submitted the latest one you would like to see what it is so user id question id and the language okay so going in the same api so if you look at the data modeling uh, or maybe the tables what i've considered and based on what i read through about this on that site so they are using first is a user's table uh, you will have a user id uh, and then you will have a name date of birth email user details and etc and you will have a cumulative score here so that cumulative score will be till date for all the challenges what the user have done and then uh, what when it was added the user was added and updated at so this is very simple but only user id and uh, the cumulative score is more important here and if you look for the challenges so it user this is a complete independent table so challenges uh, again it is almost independent again so you will have a challenge id name and start time and end time that's the only thing so then if you go for questions okay so now the question slightly becomes interesting because you have a question id and it is actually linked with the challenge right so each and every question because we are actually considering about a competition here and not the lead code way where we have other questions also whether whether they are a part of challenge or not right so in this case each and every question is be tied up with a challenge so therefore you have the challenge id as foreign key here and then you have the name of the question maybe description then the question text the test cases all linked to it and the author and added at and the editorial also and the comments and the points and the difficulty level everything will be a part of the questions one and question for, basically mm -hmm. 
so is a question a part of only one challenge uh, can a question be a part of multiple challenges also i think so no okay, okay. the way it looks like uh, it is only tied up with a single challenge okay yeah but if you want to add a different challenge because you, the challenges are like uh, on timeline basis so once the challenge happened today so we mm -hmm. have all the questions for that and then we move on to next one so we might have a different question maybe slightly tweaked so it will be a different version so it will have a different number that is what so i think that, okay mm -hmm. so in that case i think we need to have a mapping table because if one question can be a part of multiple challenges then it becomes a separate entity as question challenge maybe yeah right that is the reason what i'm saying is uh, that is the reason we won't have the same question but it will mm -hmm. be of a, some different number because we it will be an enhanced question right so it will be completely new question as per different this, question okay. yeah as per this uh, design but okay. what you say is a good uh, thing it should be clarified before even we go ahead yeah so that might be more complexity to add to that right yeah okay so, so now might be out of yeah. scope, but lead code does does have something like similar talks, similar questions. So maybe they have some pointers. Yeah, yeah. So because okay. what's the point of storing the same data again and again? Because the same question is being referred into weekly challenge as well as bi-weekly challenge. Oh, you mean to say the different challenges, right? Okay, the different yeah. type of challenges. Okay, okay. Yeah. For that, it makes sense. So you can act, but in that case, you can still pick up from the database this question ID, right? So only thing is, okay, the challenge IDs will be different. Maybe we'll have a challenge type also as a field in this question. Then. Yeah, okay. yeah, but should we ask the interviewer if we all do cannot ever repeat a question in the challenge? If that's the case, then we need that uh, keep that record. Otherwise, we don't, right? Hmm. Makes sense. I think that should be clarified before we even do that. Yeah, or we I can think. isolate the questions, right? Like, so the questions need not be associated with the challenge. The questions simply have a question ID, and uh -huh. then they, we'll have a challenge yeah. to question uh, relational mapping table. The mapping table, yeah. yeah. That basically says this particular challenge ID has these set of questions. So that oh. way, yeah. whether a question can be repeated, it's still possible, right? Like, so we don't have to worry about the repetition mm -hmm. and stuff. Okay, so you're saying that we can have a mapping with the challenges and the questions table, and then we yeah, can have yeah. a separate and, table. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and not tie a question to a specific challenge. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so we could remove normalization ID from here. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, normalization, correct. Yeah. Okay, so now yeah. the submission. Uh -huh, go ahead. And even we can have questions, the uh, tags and topics. Like, is it is it from dynamic programming or is it from binary search or something? That kind of topic. For, no, but does that covered? happen? No, but does that happen in a competition also? Okay, we are already already mm -hmm. co only yeah. covering the competition part. I right now, yes, mm -hmm. but that is also a good thing to put up somewhere. We might have uh, topic based yeah. questions, right? Yeah. If you have okay, to analyze that, like how many questions answer. for. Hmm? You will know, you won't you know the answer if the topic is given. So I mean, yeah, yeah, yeah. You, you you will get the hint. Yeah, yeah. Mm, that no, is no, also I, a good question. No, 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 no. I think uh, we might be lead code is a big platform, right? Mm -hmm. There is competition aspect, there is general, you know, practice aspect. I think we should separate that out. And from mm -hmm. what we are seeing right now here, we are leaning more towards competition. competition only. Right. Makes so maybe don't mix the lead code platform with this right? yeah yeah because that will be a very big scope <laughs> yep i mean lead code is one example right which supports that but let's yeah. just narrow it down to competitions yes. Yes. yeah yeah okay so then this is the submission table where it goes for the submission id where it, when a user is submitting his own solution so he it will have a user id and also the question id the language what he's using and the submitted code and the score, when he submits, it will actually return back at the score and what time it is created at. So this will be one table and the other will be the participation or the uh -huh. registration. Uh -huh. I think number of submissions should also be there. How many times you submitted the same code to, uh, to reach to the correct result, right? That also takes into consideration. But I think, you know, like every you time you do, submitting a, yeah, but whenever you do a uh, submission once, that will be one submission ID. If you do multiple, then you will have different submission IDs. That is what I think. Yeah, but score will be reduced in that case, right? If it is not correct, uh, I mean, 
if multiple submissions you make in order to reach to the final submission where all the test case passes right yeah so the yeah, score so the score yes the score. so the score is based like if my submission is like uh, fails right some test fail so will it have a score or will it not have a score so score basically is it based on success or failure like or yeah, it see, is just some sometimes you know they even consider if you have a partial uh, success <laughs> because okay. in some cases you know you cannot pass the time complexity of o n square or maybe o of n then you do it o n square still you are able to only pass some of the test cases so I'll, some in some uh, competition they even consider those scores okay. because you have to rate the person individually like that okay so yeah it might be possible yeah but shashank your question i i was thinking like we'll have a different submission id always and we'll have a different score for that person but when we are actually totally uh, uh, you know uh, scoring that per particular person for that particular competition we'll have to consider all these submissions so that is what i'm thinking okay. yeah something like that uh, so, so score can be part of submission also right so uh, once we calculate any uh, submission is uh, it is submitted so we are calculating score on that and uh, uh, we are some yeah. uh, uh, saving it and uh, the last uh, leaders uh, leaders board score or the user score can be the summation of all the submission scores that are like or some or some lo logic it's it, it's okay. almost like so, a cumulative sum idea right we are maintaining the score and if you do a incorrect submission i think somebody had mentioned uh that you can penalize and deduct some points yeah. and for a successful one you keep adding and uh, yeah yeah that's right so i i think this score is for an individual submission of a particular question but then if you go for this participation registration table you will have a partition i participation id the so you will have a user id challenge id so that score actually will be an aggregate of all the scores what a user has submitted for for that particular challenge so that will come here i i think you know and then whatever the accepted submissions are so these will be the number of submission counts what has been done for that user so this table will be helpful in uh, evaluating all the leaderboard okay and also every user will have its own uh, cumulative score the overall cumulative score for all the challenges till date so that will be in the user table so now if you look at the estimations okay so estimations they are ha huh, go ahead uh, yeah so participation id is like uh, a user can have a lot of participation ids based on they will be like challenge related to challenge ids is that what the relationship is so yeah so you will have a participation you will have um, many users actually participating for a particular challenge right okay so mm -hmm. maybe like 30000 users are participating for a challenge id mm -hmm. so there will be 30000 users uh, for for just one challenge id therefore you will have user id 15000 and then you will have one challenge id but you will you will have many challenges also and many users have been participating so this table mm -hmm. will be a huge one mm -hmm. and so this will help uh, in uh, calculating as well yeah Okay. the leaderboard calculation okay. and all the things will be actually done by this table okay. let us at least I, i could get from here okay so now if you look at the estimations part the total number of users it's not heavy here right this is like 10000 and they said okay just cap it to maximum 1 million but i think this is also too much and the number of user registered for any competition if you see it's like 15000 here so so you will be saying like if user performs 10 queries per competition so like the submissions if it does it around 20 10 or so and reading and everything so it be 150 queries per hour and so it can be two queries per second so i all these i think they are talking about the read right so two queries per second is also not a big thing so this can be easily handled by many of the modern servers and okay are we dealing with rate limiting also on how many submission a user could do in certain amount of time no frankly yeah. no i never thought of that but that no yeah good. we do i think uh, at least i mean again we are going to lead code but basically it would help not someone overwhelm our system right agree because this is competition so this is required i guess i don't know yeah you should not submit within a second at least or maybe more than that 
Yeah, another thing Maybe is uh, normal. Uh, you go, go. I mean, they say that your code uh, is submitted too many times within given time frame, right? At times you repeatedly submit the code. Yeah, so that is what they're saying, like the late rate limiting will help there, right? Yeah, yeah. I agree. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so another question uh, with respect to data modeling is, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I mean, uh, this is a competition and the multiple users are participating from different countries, right? Or mm -hmm. uh, you are like just establishing this competition for one country? <laughs> that's a good question. I think it should be uh, all across the globe, correct? Yep. If that's the case, then how uh, are we dealing with like, where, I mean, where all the user database is stored? I mean, is it replicated across multiple regions, uh, stuff like that? Uh, and because we need to deal with latencies in this case, right? Mm. Yeah. Because I never thought about that well, also right? when I was reading through, but that is a good point. So in that case, we'll have to share based on the geography also, is it? Mm. Mm -hmm. Maybe, yeah. Okay, we, we'll come to that later when we are actually done with at least let us assume that is going to be only for a certain region now, and then we can see how we can accommodate that requirement. Okay. Yeah, so that question is like, I mean, I don't know, whenever I do some sort of design question, that always comes into my mind that how you are actually going to deal with this kind of situation. This is very tricky. Right. We should discuss that. Because if you do it region-wise, then it will surely have other problems also. Yes. Not only yes, over the yes. data, yeah, the leaderboard also, everything. Yeah. This is always a cycle for some reason, I don't know. Yeah. Yeah. So now if you see the data. Yeah, one uh -huh. question, Sandosh. So mm -hmm. uh, at point number two, when you say users perform uh, 10 queries, you mean to say submissions, 10 submissions? Well, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah you, you, can, you can assume that maximum 10 queries if you're performing. So you will read also, mm -hmm. right? So it will be a read and write, maybe. OK. So it's Imagine 10 read and 10 write. 10, 10 submissions if you do if you do 10 writes, maybe if you just consider that way. So and if you do read more, it will be, be fine, right? Mm -hmm. okay. So okay. write will be for submissions and read will be for the leaderboard, or it will be for results plus leaderboard. It will be for uh, results as well as you want to again view the question what you're looking for, something like that, right? I don't yeah, know. So I just, I just, I'm just saying ten queries. I thought the ten queries are more important for from the right perspective. So it, it seems to be a write heavy system. Uh, also, the write is uh, if you are writing, submitting the code, it will be a big code which will be going to the compiler and executor. Uh, so I'm just trying to understand: is it a read heavy or write heavy, or like can or or can we not classify into this kind of things? Well, yeah, it will be read for, uh, sorry, it will be write for sure, right? Having in the sense when we are executing code, when we are submitting it, and that for that competition, at least it will surely be a write heavy, right? But reads are also going to be there, but only the same number of users are going to be reading it. So I would say it will be more of a write heavy, but the ratio is not going to be too huge, right? But yeah, I think I think uh, I that. think mm -hmm. I think one point to consider there is if we are thinking about uh, real time like periodic refreshes of leaderboard, right? Mm -hmm. uh, that every time you make a submission, you are able to see that. Mm -hmm. Then you are also doing a lot of reads, right? Every time some people are submitting code, mm -hmm. that analytics has to run, uh, data has to be read, and mm -hmm. uh, it has to produce results, right? Uh, but if there is, if I think in our problem here, we have scoped it out to be at the end, you see the leaderboard, right? Mm -hmm. So from that perspective, it seems to me it's more write heavy mm -hmm. because you're focusing more on rights. Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, I think this is something we can maybe brainstorm use one of this, like how is leaderboard presented, right? Is it mm -hmm. periodic? Is it uh, at the end? Mm -hmm. To me, that's yeah. where reads are going, right? Yeah. That's so let's, even, let's, uh -huh, go. even I think that sometimes it, it's read heavy because uh, uh, like it has to compare the results, right? It has to compare against the specific results. Oh, right, right, right. Yeah, it has to compute that. Yeah. Do that. It has to compare the results that. because like yes, it yes. can compare like what the user has written. It only can compare the output. Uh, the user uh, like execute true, true. I think. Like it, otherwise, it should show all the test cases. No, no, I was thinking. Um... So maybe we can say, okay, leaderboard is done at the end for now. Okay, let's yeah. not um, mix that. 
So we just consider it is going to be, we are just submitting it for the competition. And at the end, and we do it. Uh, and, and yeah, and one other question I had more generic, not specific to this. Whenever we talk about read heavy, write heavy system, right? Uh, I think there are, I sometimes get confused because there are two ways to look at it. One is read or write heavy with respect to APIs, right? What client is submitting. If mm -hmm. I'm trying to refresh and check the leaderboard quickly, right? Uh, periodically, mm -hmm. then it's like a client request, right? That's a read request mm -hmm. versus if let's say we are going with the current design where leaderboard is at the end. Now mm -hmm. the system behind the scenes is scanning maybe data, you know, periodically mm -hmm. to have the leaderboard be ready quickly at the end. Mm -hmm. So that doesn't count as a read request, right? That's a different case. Like, but I'm, I'm thinking like when we talk about read, write request, what is the context we are looking at? Is See, it the client uh, the request? Way, the way yeah. I think is whenever a uh, request hits on a application. So, okay, okay. So, so that request, is, uh, that yeah. Means. So it seems to me like that. But when okay. you're saying those things which are happening at the back end, yeah, so yeah. that should be some processes which are actually, they have the access to all the data stores, right? Correct. So they don't have to come through all the network and all those things. And uh, again, mm -hmm. coming through the, Mm -hmm. load balancing and the app server right? no, yeah sure sure that's true so that is all so the internal things on the internal microservices mm -hmm. yeah so that is okay. my thoughts about it but yeah one more thing mm -hmm. uh, it might be off topic mm -hmm. so do we do we do the some uh, compression also like some kind of uh, optimization while we are sending the code over the web to the uh, compiler or executor like we can, that we can might think. be the, might be the next mm -hmm. step, right? I think he's just yeah, presenting yeah. the high I, level. So mm -hmm. Not yeah, sure. I, I, yeah, I'm saying client... this, we can note it down. Yeah, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, yeah. Um, I thought this should be more of a. Do we send the code to run somewhere, or is it on the client? We run the code. No, we send it to the server. We don't we run it to the client. It's a HTTP okay. request, by the yeah. way. Okay. And the content okay. is GG uh, compressed. Oh, okay. Okay. Got it. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. The payload is language question ID and typed code, which was one string of your entire code mm. for the submit post request. So anyway, see if you if you are saying that our code has to be secured, we want to have a compression or all those things, right? So the compression is if, if only if the code is too huge, right? But so, so do we have so huge codes in the competitions? It's like maybe a, a four or two a four size pages, maybe I, like. No, I think 1K it is maximum loads. Mm -hmm. line More of than hundred lines. Right? Yeah, so so yeah. the smaller the payload is, the faster it is to you know transmit it. So I think that's what they are trying to do. Okay, okay. So uh, on terms in terms of HTTP request, right? Okay, makes sense then. Okay, so so the second now about the data size. If you just look at how the data size is based on all these uh, user tables. So a user table will say it's, ha it's having about 300 bytes and that is what they calculate based on all the fields. And just believe me, that is what it is now here. So I don't want to go in details of each and every field. So for that, like if we have around 1 million users, so it's going to be around 300 MB. So now it's, we are just calculating all the data sets here. So for challenge table, it's going to be around 200 bytes and it will be like, if you have 10,000 challenges, maximum till date so it, it is around 2 mb okay so roughly like that so questions uh, it is about 11 kb here uh, per question uh, okay it's going to be per record right yeah so it will be that and so if we have say roughly around 50000 problems solved till date that is huge so it's around 60 600 mb and then the submissions table, we each and every submission takes around 3 KB of data. Uh, so maybe around 6 MB for an average user who tries four times and all that thing and attempts around 500 questions in his lifetime. Okay, So that will be around that much uh, of the data. And now the actually, if you look at all the data tables, they are not so big, but only for the participation, it, it in increases because it has a relationship with others. So if you have 15,000 participants per challenge, and uh, so the challenge table is 250, correct? So 15K multiplied by 250 with uh, 3KB because we'll have a submission, 
right? So, and if you have four submissions per person, therefore three k into four. So this comes to around roughly forty five GB, which will be a dominant uh, one actually considering the data size. So roughly we look at around fifty GB of uh, current storage. And so therefore, if you look at all these data, it seems to be uh, it's not a big thing because uh, the our relational databases usually if they're lesser than a couple of hundred GBs, it's easy for them to handle that load, right? So that is what I they are sending towards. Uh -huh. Sorry. I have a question. So mm -hmm. we are submitting code. Mm -hmm. That's a file, right? Uh, mm -hmm. That's some, some, some bytes of file, I guess. Are we using Blob Store or we are storing the file compressed in our system itself? Uh, you mean to say storing the file as a blob store? Yeah, I mean, are we using no, some no. kind of blob store to store the file or we are compressing the file? I mean, some bytes uh, yeah. format and then using that inside in our system itself. Here we are not doing anything like that. We are just actually, you know, whatever it is in the text form, we are just storing it. Okay. So there's nothing done like that and no blob storage. It's a very uh -huh. simple text file, whatever we get, we just store it in the table also. Uh, you can okay. see it somewhere in the questions, I think. Yeah, submitted code. But, why code? but, but over the time, the size will increase for the DB, right? What are we doing regarding that? So see, I was, I was if you look at these calculations, uh, till now we had about uh, 15,000 participants and we had around uh, something like, uh, uh, 10,000 challenges, right? So that's a huge one. So if you, if you look at that, and I think lead code also doesn't have that many challenges till date. Uh, so mm -hmm. for 50 GB per 10 years or maybe five years, and uh, it's enough data and mm -hmm. that can be easily handled. Mm -hmm. So just to get a, a, a you know, high level uh, understanding of feasibility of how much data storage we need, oh. we just coming to that. Lead also, code actually... It's a rough estimate. It might so be more lesser type, also. Mm -hmm. If the type is text, right, in the SQL column, it mm -hmm. is stored out of row in data pages and the row will just have a pointer. Okay. Type equal to text. So whether it's one byte or two GB, it doesn't matter. Okay. So you'll have a separate... Um... Yeah, this is what it's saying on SQL server will always store the text type column out of row in data pages. Okay, so that is the reason that won't be considered here, right? Good. Kind of document based, right? I mean, a separate field will have for which a dedicated table will be there, right? No, but a document uh, database no, goes very different. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. The SQL is handling it. If you say the type is text, right? Instead of where shall you just say text? So it's automatically storing it out of the row and somewhere else and storing a pointer in the row. So that is what happens in your NoSQL, right? I in think my... so. Yeah, yeah. So yeah, I am I have doubt like how SQL is handling that. Then it might be a foreign key, something like that corresponding to each user, and they'll point to that another table. I mean, let's see. Yeah, that's a good point. Okay. Yeah. So on a high level, this is the high level design. Uh, so you have this client, okay, web browser, and then we have a load balancer. We have different uh, app servers, and the all of these app servers, they are stateless, right? The servers will be stateless, that is what it talks about. And so anyone can handle any request. Uh, so this is a data layer, wherein all our data about these metadata, what we talked about, that, that will be stored in this database. And uh, we'll have a cache also. Uh, so we will cache a lot, many other stuff. And then this is a submitted code execution layer, what they talk about. So what happens whenever we submit a code, so it comes here and then it is given to this text case executor or some module, which will actually uh, run some separate containers. And these containers will be running isolated in a sandbox environment. So whatever we compile, if the code is not good, it's going to harm the system, it won't harm because the containers will be isolated and they will run whatever the code in that and execute again the test cases in that special containers. So it's going to be more secure. That is the way it will be executed. 
So this is what the model everyone uses. Most of them use, I would say, everyone. Uh -huh. Uh, Santa, sorry, ha, 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 how many submissions do we have per one second? Do we have one second? That's a good Yeah, question. how I many submissions? It submission. is almost the same thing, like the two queries per second will be the submissions per second. Mm -hmm. Okay. So, so just two submissions per one second. Okay. Right, because if you have 15,000 um, participants and then 10 queries they are submitting per computation and uh, this 150 queries are per hour, so it roughly comes around two queries per second. Right, so that should be enough if you have multiple containers to handle that, right? Yeah. And not, not a very heavy load system, but yeah. But it's only about the test case aggregator or whatever the compilation, everything is done in a separate container sandbox environment. So that is the only different part of this whole uh, OG systems. Okay, so they talk about some of the things like um, what it is, a user communicates with the application via web browser, multiple application server that query data from the data store to distribute the load. Right? That, is, that is why we have multiple replication here also. And then all the servers are stateless and so load balance is more simpler. It has just to distribute the load, that's all. And the data store will just store all the metadata of the user completion questions and submissions and all the same. And the CPU intensive machines run the submitted code against the pre-configured test cases in this test case executor. So therefore they use containers for that. Okay, and therefore you're looking at the database, the size is not huge and uh, we can easily handle using a SQL because it's more structured. And then uh, if we go for different things about getting the scores based on the participation, it will be more easier to do. That is what I think, you know, so therefore they have finally on SQL here. Yeah. My SQL may be, but uh, SQL database. Uh, test case executors are sharded, right? Uh, I mean, which language? I mean, based on language, I guess. Yeah. So, see, a, a container will actually, see, it will be configured based on a language, isn't it? Mm -hmm. So, it will have its own environment. It will have a separate, maybe a Linux virtual machine, something like that, or a Windows virtual machine. So then whatever compiler we are setting, so it will just set that compiler, it will compile ac according to that, and then execute all the test cases which it can um, point to that particular question. Okay. okay. So, yeah, so this no we can have multiple, mm -hmm. Yeah, and we can have multiple environments like uh, Python also, we can execute in one container, we can execute Java also. So yeah, so any container know. should be universal. They should be able to execute any of those, right? So it's just based on the configuration. So the con container has to be configured that way. That is what I think. So if it has to just run the code, it can be Lambda also. W what's that? Amazon Lambda. Okay, I, Lambda. I don't know about that. Yeah, you, you can actually- Yes, yes, that, yes, yeah. yes, it can be. Like, but it just depends like, uh, <laughs> and lambda, it, lambda gets stateless. expensive right true true but lambda can get expensive so you need to be very very about the cost if you're okay with the cost then it's fine but like uh adagios lambda and ec2 like uh, the ec2 servers are more expensive than adagios lambda so it, lambda is more expensive because fully managed no it's not about that like adagios lambda only gets provisioned when uh, like uh when it, when it, when it gets triggered like, so that's why like we use AWS Lambda. It depends on the architecture as well. Like we can use AWS Lambda as a microservice instead of like in easy to running on EC2 server. True. But but it takes some 30 seconds time to boot up. Two, two, yeah, two, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. It does. Uh, yeah. Depending on the so like when you have to scale, like yeah. So it is it is not good for a spiky traffic load. Yeah. right if you have a constant high traffic load then probably again lambdas are fine because if you have a spiky traffic you will have some latency there yeah i think it's around 1 million requests per second or something like uh, but at first like users will see some delay like because the uh, the lambda container it has to start so that that might be one of the, the trade offs but it's so how I solve that problem on my services, I use, I kind of knew what my traffic is. 
and I used to kind of keep my uh, lambda instances kind of warm. Oh, okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Sort of fix it. Um, every time they get a request, I understand. Uh, so one, one question. One question. Uh, yeah. Uh, sorry. Yeah, uh, yeah. Regarding this lambda, uh, so can we uh, have configure like uh, one uh, at least uh, uh, one one container or for the lambda that could be run? You have to uh, keep them this? warm it's because they are managed. Oh, okay. Amazon will shut them down if there is no traffic coming to them. Mm. Uh, okay. Okay, so we can we can configure that uh, minimum one or something like that uh, or like that. No, so you two. so we keep on sending such kind of like a heartbeat thing that doesn't do anything. It just hits the lambda. Okay, okay, okay. Yeah, and then we know at least one of our lambda is always alive. And then if any request, because this is like a collision detection service. So if someone is in an accident and it takes time to heat up the lambda, it might be not so good. So, yeah, so we wanted to make sure that, uh, and we had a spiky load, right? So, yeah, thankfully people are not getting into collisions all the time. So, but there can be like one, five requests during evenings or during, you know, weekends. So uh, that's, that's kind of a spiky load we had. Mm -hmm. One question I have there is, mm -hmm. uh, let's say you, uh, talking from the interview setting perspective, right? Let's mm -hmm. say somebody doesn't know about like, AWS is has a lot of technologies, right? So mm -hmm. if you have some knowledge into it, that's amazing. Mm -hmm. But if let's say if I don't know much about Lambda, right? Mm -hmm. uh, I don't want to bring it up. Then mm -hmm. talking from the first principles, right? Mm -hmm. Like we said that okay, this test case executor has to be sharded. If we shard it based on language, for example, so mm -hmm. we have one one environment set up for Java, one for C plus plus, and so on. Mm -hmm. Do you think the a more generic question, you know, can lead us to, like, if I have one one environment for Java, uh, you know, sort of how to manage the load because there might be a lot yeah. of submissions so, coming on Java. So things like you know more derivations of general principles rather than specific technology stack. Yeah, because, even generally speaking, sharding uh -huh. based on tech is going to be unbalanced load, right? Mm -hmm. So sharding based on Java or Python is mm -hmm. not a good yeah. idea. Yeah, correct, correct. So we so have just, just machines, right? So every machine should be configurable. That's what I think, isn't it? It should be based on the number of participants, how much we are, and how many yeah, are yeah, going to be executed. Yeah, together, right? yeah. But I'm. I was saying that uh, if we know the sort of, I'm, I'm thinking like, is there some room for dynamic rebalancing, right, of load? Because the load yes, can you can always it. scale up if you have generic right. if you have generic instances which run anything mm -hmm. you can always yeah. scale up right yeah. you can right, say right. if my CPU true. threshold goes more than sixty sure, sure. just of yeah course. add more yeah okay okay yeah uh, one suggestion also so if you are starting one basis of uh, tech also so what is a problem if if more more Java is, uh, Java is coming so we can have more Java instances. Right? Right. Yeah, we can scale selectively. Yeah. 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 So in that case, yes. I think you know, I won't worry about no, that it's because not I our instances, I guess. I mean, it can be a plain, it cannot be, I mean, it can even be a plain server where the server Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't mean I don't mean Java instances mean Java. Yeah. But I mean Java Java like curve, whatever. I would say. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah for me, I would every say every time you launch a process, you you execute that and then you get the result of the process and you save yeah, it so, into the store. Yeah, but I feel there'll be a lot of upscale and downscale, like, you know, uh, you in your system, if you have such kind of, I mean, that's just my way of looking at infrastructure that I try to have uh, generic instances as, as far as possible. Mm -hmm. so, but so I would say I will instances. always be, mm -hmm. sorry, go ahead, yeah. Generic instances in particular, I feel have problems. Say for example, when you run Java, right? JVM takes quite some time in at least warm up and you know, executing the code, particularly while Go or C++ or C, they are fast enough. They could like, I mean, you know, they could handle double the load 
in that particular point in time so generic is a no i don't know no, but so, in my opinion based on my experience uh -huh. generic is not a way to no so how i see this have working is you do not start you 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 have this kind of a readiness to a instance right you do not start serving traffic to a instance unless everything is working so all your api should say okay this i'm ready right okay so so in order to add to that one so what i'm thinking is it's a kind of a pool of con pool of run times that you have you just assign them and they they do their work and yeah 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 so the, we'll have that something an abstraction layer on top of that right so this is actually layer will take care of all the management isn't it so but so how it is going to be managed that will be a big topic in itself right yeah so basically you push every event and then i mean i don't know some work yeah, in a queue and mean. then yeah but i queue i feel we need to be very synchronous no or it can be asynchronous i don't know no, this will be asynchronous call okay. right so okay. we'll have a queue for sure oh yeah okay 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 it. got it got it and we we don't care how much time it takes to return back mm -hmm, as, mm -hmm. as long as it is returning back and mm -hmm, putting mm -hmm. the scores right mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So that is what I, I, I yeah. queue queues can okay. I I feel with queues that it can keep on re re queuing the message if something is not working, and but it's okay. Like if someone is getting a late uh, result after submission, is is it is acceptable, right? Hmm. That is what I think. But, but yeah, what you say is also right. When you submit something and you would like to know the result before you proceed to the second question, correct? That is also one question. One thing. You don't so, want to just leave it like that. Mm -hmm. So Sorry. here with queuing mechanism, there is another problem. You need to revert, return back the result to client. Now, when you put queue in between, right, you fire and forget. Okay. Uh, no, there are there are futures, right, in 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 languages now. So they will oh, wait. Yeah. That kind of execution. All right, yeah. Fine. Yeah. That yeah. Yeah. What was that? You said futures. Uh, so uh, it it was already it probably in Scala. Java took it uh, recently. I would say from maybe eight or nine. It's a promise, so you right? can uh, you think yeah, it's a promise. Yeah. So you basically say uh, just uh, don't block this thread, if uh, you know, and uh, keep keep on doing the other task which you want to. And whenever the result will be returned to me, then I'll proceed on doing this task. Yeah. Just inform me when the result is returned, and then yeah, I'll and then I'll proceed it. with the next ones. Yeah. Okay, same thing. It's kind of, right? it's kind of pressure on the OS. Golang. I think that's again a pressure on OS. I think in Node, and you have single thread, they take most of the threads from the OS, isn't it? And then they multi thread. Although Node is a single thread, but still it behaves like a multi threaded application. Why? Because of the threads it is taking from the OS, yeah, isn't it? Right, right. But it's Node has an event loop, right? So it's continuously yeah. checking. So how is Java knowing that the future is complete? Is it also continuously checking? It won't no, fall. No. See, it will be all event bases, right? So yes, this is event, event driven. Okay. Most of what I was are NIO based, so non-blocking IOs. Uh huh. So the request comes, and the request would be taken as from the uh, separate threads would be taken, uh -huh. and it will give it to some other second layer of thread pools. And once the response available, the the thread which is has submitted the request would give it back. So there will be no blocking of threads because of the request. So the multiple requests can be processed. That's that's like that's how Nginx and other stuff. So the new thread will uh, directly give it to the client or he'll give it to the original thread. No, it will give a give to the next level of thread pool to process it. So Understood. one level of thread pool will always takes the request and give it to the thread pool, the next level thread pool, and and even that first level of thread pool will basically collects the responses also after the results have arrived and give it to the uh, server back. I mean the client back. That's how NIO works. I mean most of the servers nowadays I think are NIO based. Mm -hmm. And anyway, in this case, we are always connected to the server for the whole competition, right? So, right. so we don't need some other notification method to notify us. No, no, no. It's within the server internals. NIO is server internals. How server is implemented. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. Okay, good. 
so uh, moving on to but if uh, we don't think as a container we mm -hmm. can think it as a rest apis which takes the request of executing some java code or python code right mm -hmm. and what it does is it that that code will simply launch a process that can be done i mean using a process uh, apis every language has mm -hmm. to launch a process and once the process returns something it will give it back to the uh, client as a rest rest call whatever response it gives right yeah you this can is think that, this is right I mean, yes. if, if at all think... container was not there we, that would be the way it could have yeah. been implemented right? the container comes into picture because it has to be more secure because someone might write a malicious code and that even if you have a process you can still go and so we have time out right so that's why time out right yeah the, it's just for the time out but if someone actually tries to get into resources of some other process you know by this code some it kind of a ddos wrong. attack you or yeah about. yeah yeah so therefore they are actually talking about all the sandboxing that is the main actually in those ojs but even there some kind of a timeout has to be employed by the process like if process yeah, yeah. is not it's running when it's accessing the memory outside it's allowed i feel so, instead of process uh, you should be launching a new process there can be something like a process pool where mm -hmm. a set of process will be there and uh, which is already started which will be keep on running and we give that task to that process something like a server process right we always server process process always keeps on running we give we something to compile to it. the code right we have to compile the user's code and then run it he is saying that you have another process for a compiler also no okay something like that so then you keep doing that maybe may possible but then we'll have to consider everything or maybe yeah, i'm just know. thinking in terms of uh, general uh, yeah. load balance and rest api instead of container i mean having a container mm -hmm. entered thinking mm -hmm. and also you have nothing on that server just these things executing so you don't bother about the security right even if it crashes is going to crash the other participants code but yeah, yeah. Then that will be a bad experience right user experience that is also problem we have to protect our users also who are actually more focused on working and we don't have any other problems with the users so then so, we have uh, this, right uh, i have a question santosh uh -huh. so in these kind of a scenario in these kind of systems do we save the submission in the database and then give it for execution to maintain the reliability so for example if the container goes down while i have made a submission uh so should i save my submission first and then evaluate it or how does it work i think you that is a very good point i would say first submit into the submission table okay all the code um, how will we and, get the score and yeah when when we actually submit then we'll get a score yeah right so I then think, i'll have to yeah, go and think, update my submission yeah. table again but yeah, i think it I, is it is almost hmm. like to me i am drawing an analogy with in general the way whatsapp does right when so if you think of three entities right you are a client or a user submitting your code here and then there is a you you get the notification like not no notification but your code is submitted right when it says judging or something and mm -hmm. then you get an evaluation right that's the result part so right. I, i'm just drawing an analogy with whatsapp so you client sends a message and then you get delivered notification and then you get the red notification so, right okay so as yeah. so, Yeah. So as per so you, I'm, so as per you, there are different states for that yeah, submission yeah, to happen, right? Yeah, yeah. So, so I'm thinking follow, like when. So, right. so, so, so I'm my, thinking like. Mm -hmm. Sorry, go ahead. Go ahead. No, please, please go ahead. Please go ahead. No, I was just saying that maybe like once the code is in the you know it's submitted, it's in the assessment process, right? Depending right. on if a, if a container is down or something like that, I know right. at least the code is stored, right? I can store it in a queue okay. or something. I have to make okay. sure that once okay. the client gets the Think that okay, it's judging, right? I know it's submitted, so it right. should be durable, right? It so, can't get lost. Right. But right. once it's evaluated, I think then, depending on requirements, I think then it doesn't need to be saved anymore. Okay, so right? my follow-up question thinking. is that my follow-up yeah. question on that is: if we are storing first, then yeah, I yeah. can enter whatever garbage values to in the submission, so we will be storing them as well. What do you mean, garbage values? Like, uh, like I can write any anything random, uh, mm -hmm. not yeah. code or anything. Yeah. So yeah. we will be yeah. saving them as well. 
and it would yeah. probably fail at the compile stage. So do we come back yeah. and remove those entries? I yeah, think that so. is a good I... question. We should actually, because we I think should, we right? talk yeah. about it, about such yeah. user, we need to identify because they do for the plagiarism also, plagiarism, right? Right, right. So that if they can do it, then we should be able to do for these uh, users also. We need to stop these users from for actually writing this code. Oh, yeah, I see what you're point. saying. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. should we have a filter whenever a submission yeah. is made? Should should, yeah. should we have a pre-filter where it just at least compiles? Yeah, 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 yeah. Yeah, we can have like different. You're talking about now multi-level evaluation, mm -hmm. right? Compile right. time. It's, like it an like an eligibility yeah. filter for yeah. the system to yeah. even accept it. Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay. That's a very good point. Yeah. That's, that's a, yeah. Yeah. Uh, compile mm -hmm. uh, we are talking about because there, there is something uh, I think uh, most of the systems have uh, run taste or something like that and then there is something submit right those are different uh, I think uh, it comes in late code and others yeah I think so compile yeah. happens in the run test and uh, submit is a different option like where it will go mm -hmm. and uh, test on, on internal uh, more test cases suppose uh, just compile happens on two test cases and the uh, submit will happen yeah, yeah. on more yeah. complex yeah. test cases and it will it will calculate uh, the performance of the code yep. on different uh, large right. data sets or uh, like that yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. so, so we, are, we are like uh, when someone is going for submit so that means that uh, code is uh, code is uh, like functional. The first it's functional. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Phase. It may be wrong uh, in uh, yeah. large data sets. Yeah. It is uh, passing the initial uh, one. Yeah. The, uh, yeah. I think the is. main takeaway, the way I'm thinking about this is like thinking of it as a multi-step process, right? Like you're having stages, and so, like so, you said. So, no. But every container is kind of a, it has to maintain certain kind of a state. I guess. No, container, I think it's going to be only just execute, that's all. And just set the result. No, while executing, see, let's say, uh, which test cases are passed, which are failed, what is the result of so that? So whatever it gets, it's just going to return the result. That's all. And then that has to be taken yeah, care of. Yeah, both way, I think, uh, so, sorry. So you mean to say it's not stateful, it's just a stateless and we can horizontally scale? That is what I think, because they should be, right? It should be stateless, the container. But eventually state about the result has to be stored in DB, I guess. Yeah, see, whenever, whenever I get a submission, okay, I know what the submission is. I store the code of the submission in my submission table, okay? So mm -hmm. then I go and I know that the second thing what I have to do is I have to submit it to the text executor. So if I uh, yeah, submit my code to the text executor, the container is going to execute and return the results. And then when I get the results, I'm going to uh, I can store that code in my submission table for that particular submission ID. So that will be one simple task mm -hmm. I have to do. Okay. So there will be, let's say, 100 test cases here. For each one, it would be running the no, based on based on all the results the somewhere cases. in somewhere yeah. in the container, and then finally it has to give some file pointer or something, right? No. So the test case actually, the way I look at it, if you have hundred test cases, so based on how much test cases it is running and how many test cases it passes, or if it passes for all of them, so it is just going to come get one score, maybe a simple number based on zero to hundred. So where it actually it lies, and that number will actually be written to the DB. So that this will be only for passing test cases. So if everything is passing, it will still maintain a core from zero to hundred. So and if it is not passing, then it will have a different way of doing it. But it will just have a number. That is the way okay. I look at it. Okay. It's not trying to store each and every test case, whatever the details are, because if you look at the table, they are very simple. But yeah, what do you say? We can add all those complexities and we have to make it because when we want to really judge per the contest, we have to look for many things. It's not only this. Yeah. yeah. So this complexity will surely increase. But for now, on a high level, it's very simple. Yeah, but then there are a lot of questions coming up, right? So things will be more complex for sure. And it's not that easy also the way we look at it now. Yeah, I agree. Okay, so I'll just move ahead.
Okay, so this uh, was everything, and then they they talk about something very high level. They touch base about all this stuff. Okay, before going that, you know, I will just quickly run through all these um, APIs, and uh, so how, whether they really satisfy the way we were doing it. I just want to go to that. So now, if you look for this first API, when we said register user, so register user, what it does is it will go, it will have a user ID and a competition ID. So what actually I think it does is uh, it goes to this participation table, okay? And then for in the participation table, it will go for this user ID and the challenge ID. So this is where actually it just registered itself. So it will use this table only. That is what I look. So at least uh, this uh, API, it just looks for this table and it stores its information. For the submit code, if you look at it, you have a user ID, you have a question ID and the language and code text. So it will use this submission table. Okay, it will go to this uh, user for that user ID for that question, it will submit all its information. And that is what this submit code API will do. Okay, but yeah, after that, there will be other things also what we discussed. But only the initial thing, what will happen and how it is tied up with the data model, I'm just trying to go through. And then the get history, actually it goes to user ID. And actually in this case, it will go to the challenges, I think. You know? Because for this, okay, so no, for guest history, actually go to the submissions table. For that particular user ID, it will get all the uh, submissions. And then based on the questions ID, it will go to the challenges. Okay, and from the challenges, it will go to the participation table and find all the details of th that particular user and return as an history. Okay, maybe or maybe just go to the participation table for that particular user ID and then get all the history of all the challenges, what happened. I'm sorry, yeah, it might be doing that way. And for fetch leaderboard, for fetch leaderboard, actually it will go to the Okay, so this becomes slightly interesting. Uh, it will go to a particular challenge, right? Okay, I think it is somewhere below. Uh, so for a particular challenge, it will go, still go to the participation table. It will go for that particular current challenge because the leaderboard will be only for the current challenge. And then it will get all these user IDs and all the scores based on their descending order. It will rate all of them. Okay, so that will be the uh, le leaderboard API. So, Santosh, uh -huh. one question. Mm -hmm. I have one small question. Uh, so, I see a score at a participation level, which is associated with the challenge ID. Okay. And then I see a score, which is in the submissions table, which is associated with the question level. Mm -hmm. So, in a challenge, there could be multiple questions. So, here, uh, the score in the participation is the score of the complete challenge. Yeah. Yeah. And the score in the submission is the score per question. Yeah. So this okay. actually and score is for, per question. So, and then you'll have many questions per challenge. And then those will be, ha, you know, com, some way compare, maybe compiled in such a way. Okay. That score will actually be uh, tied up with the challenge ID. So will, so, the, will the participation table score get computed after the challenge is over? Yeah. Yeah, so that will be some process doing all that stuff. And I think that that's the requirement we are going with. It, right. I know, like we were talking about earlier, right? That you can yeah. do periodic, but that's not out of scope for this discussion. Yeah. Okay. okay. Yeah. So for periodic, then it will be a different altogether, right? Yeah. So if you look at that, now the scoring mechanism. So what it says is, in some cases, you'll have to even find out the time spent after a problem was opened by your user and before he submits. So how much time he has spent on that? So those also will impact your scoring. Other than your actual scoring of the test case execution, these things are also taken into consideration by some of the online judging systems. And then the partial scoring also is taken into consideration. In some cases, even if you submit an ON square solution for ON, still you are giving some score uh, still you have to re be rated so that is why these things are going to have an another impact on your uh, score and the number of incorrect submissions also if you give more incorrect submissions then it's going to have a negative e effect on your scoring and then multiple submission of correct scores will be updated in the submission table but that might also have an impact 
in a positive way or negative way it depends on the judging platform so based on all these things so i think you know if you look at all this stuff it makes more sense to do at the uh, at the end of the contest right or if the user terminates himself saying okay i'm completely done with my uh, session so at least for those users you can rank them but that ranking will be still in a transit state right because you might find some better users coming up based on if you even if you consider for all these other conditions there might be more also right so things might be more complex so that is the reason i was thinking about it is always better to have that uh, lead reward at the end of the session but doesn't look like and okay so this is one very simple way of looking at the leaderboard you do a select query on select your query on a participation table where your challenge id will be your current challenge and you just order by the descending so this will be a very simplistic way of doing it so you will at least get all the leaderboard but then you will have to take into consideration of all these other parameters also of scoring it okay and then you can tie up with your uh, cumulative users whatever the cumulative score you have in your users table so you you would like to compare that also in some cases so that is one thing okay so now if you look at the other stuff uh, caching they say you need to do caching for leaderboards because you many users at least for that particular uh, when the challenge is done we would like to get those results and read it very frequently so that will need to be cached set of questions for a challenge has to be cached then the profile of an active user i don't know whether it's really needed but fine and active user score history maybe and get practice problems sorted on a difficulty level yeah but this is not actually for our scope anyway because we are not targeting that uh, scenario and so what happens if a machine fails so all our database actually has a master slave architecture so reads are done by slaves and the writes are done through master okay so even if it fails then the slave will be actually pushed to master and all that so that will be taken care of and um, data is like less so a single master without sharding is sufficient but someone discussed about that saying okay let us if we go away our different regions then that might be a other thing to take care of okay so yeah so this is some... mm -hmm. replication won't be there about i mean i didn't understand that point data is less to single master without sharding yeah so I we are saying that because the data is not huge right so when the data is huge then we want to actually shard it isn't it so yeah, the data sharding, is very small mm -hmm. yeah but i think sharding like when we talk about master slave that's mm -hmm. we are talking about replication area and right. then sharding is another uh section right like it's not it's a totally different context here uh so partitioning sharding is partitioning right? correct On exactly the... exactly but i'm saying that replication and partitioning you can't mix them up right you can't talk about them in the same like they are they go together because of the looking at the scale of data mm -hmm. but they are two different concepts right the moment you talk about master slave mm -hmm. right you're talking about i mean depends what all i'm saying is i think we should separate them out yeah because when you talk about master slave suddenly you, there are so many other areas that come into picture right um, so mm -hmm. yeah. yeah so actually you're saying mm -hmm. yeah. and especially right. and, and one other thing just to mention right uh, so since we are talking also about a write heavy system right we are there are a lot of submissions happening mm -hmm. uh, something to talk about is Uh, like santosh mentioned right if master fails you mm. can you know pick up something from a list of followers and do that but mm -hmm. i think one of the other things to take care is when you are having a write heavy system uh, mm -hmm. and if uh, like think around single leader like single master what you talked about but your mm -hmm. writes can suffer in that so you might want to think about having multi leader approaches uh, like how would you scale your writes because in a typical master slave it's mainly about read scalability yeah, yeah i don't yeah. worry in this case because mm -hmm. the way i am thinking is because uh -huh. we have only two queries per second right so maybe it's even if it's right heavy the load is not mm -hmm. huge isn't it so that is why the way i'm but uh, i think like according to like what you said like the master is the one which is getting the request right like, yeah like taking the uh, right which request. means that uh, like 
like you, you can also have like uh, high like two masters or three yeah yeah multi masters right? multi meter yeah multi- yeah, yeah. yeah. like yeah. multiple masters as well yeah so yeah. like it's like a ha like within masters correct correct yes yeah. so you can yeah. do and can use some kind of sharing mechanism like storage yep 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 nfs storage to do see instead of having a multi master okay see what will happen if i don't have a multi master okay only thing is uh, what, if the master fails okay mm-hmm. so then whatever the current transaction is happening it it won't be happen correct but if i have if if my um, browser okay whatever i'm working on again retries for that mm-hmm. so i have like, a retry mechanism that no no it has to be up like it is one yeah. of the right like at uh, least sorry i think someone is eating can you please mute thank you mm-hmm. the, the master is up should be up right to schedule the request if the master is up like like no user can actually submit any any re- like request for it. It, it it can't run schedule uh uh request on computer nodes or like what on stage availability is screwed in that case okay yeah makes sense Yeah. So, yeah, I think in distributed systems, mm-hmm. I mean everything is possible. It's just about the trade-offs. Right, right, absolutely. Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, I agree. No, but so that's a good point, actually. Huh? Yes, so conclusion is like, if it is a right-heavy system, we, we should go for the multi-leader, right? I mean, multi-master. Yeah, that's what I'm thinking. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. if it's a right-heavy, then a single master and a, I mean, slave or well, single master. Well, uh, uh-huh. at least, yeah. In general, it depends. Yeah. Yeah. What the I'm only problem is... going with multi master will be you will have more complications correct it's going to be okay. anyway mm-hmm. so it is fine so uh, just is the database in that case Come usually in. partitioning is used when 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 we have a write heavy system right like so uh, that is where uh, the the writes are basically partitioned across multiple nodes so yeah no that, that, that is true exactly, that is exactly true. called as multi master uh, but Uh, we still partition the rights across multiple right so no partitioning will be definitely there uh, in case of to distribute the load but what i was thinking is even if you have one shard right that is taking care of uh, you know certain accepting certain rights then talking about replication right i think in the replication context i was thinking should we have single master or multi master but i think it's a topic on its own the moment you start talking about synchronous asynchronous replication it just expands so um yeah, this is a good thing i'll i'll make a note of it sure it will be good helpful for me yeah thank you so i'll so just, when we so uh-huh. when we talk about multi master or a multi leader is it is it in the context of sharding no i'm talking in context of replication okay when Sh- we sharding will still always be there right mm-hmm. yeah sharding will be there mm-hmm. but they here say we don't need sharding because the data isn't too much yeah that is what he is saying but yeah but you can always have a discussion on trade offs and uh, the interval might come uh, back again, right? so so when we talk about multi master right so take an example of postgres uh, when you have two different masters there right if you are trying to set up multi master uh, setup uh, then both of the masters will have the same data it's just that the when they are replicating okay it's not sharding essentially it's no, just no, two that different is, masters no, same that, data a sync replication sure sure i mean you're right so in general replication when we talk about independently replication you are assuming that the data set is such that it can fit like every node can host the whole copy of the data right yes. and in that case you're talking about okay single leader multi master what not yeah, so here uh, uh, in this context multi master which uh, i mean two different masters keeping the same data set a sync replication makes sense for uh, dealing with writes yeah yeah Two Otherwise, you masters, can use distributed database where uh, you will have sharding, of course. Uh, say, for example, Arrow Spike is one of, one example. Cassandra is another example, uh, which is write heavy uh, optimized. We could use, uh, and it automatically take care of your availability part. Uh, it is configurably available and consistent. Mm. So you said multi application. So. 
multi master uh, i mean uh, when we talk about multi master right uh, when i'm uh, uh, by taking an example of postgres uh, i mean you have two different masters they are a sync replicating from each other uh, you can configure them uh, in such a way that only one master is taking all the rights and other master is just replicating but is a host standby other way you could do, deal with this is both of the master are, masters are accepting the rights. Now they need to deal with how frequent they are replicating from each other. But uh, so, if one master is only taking, then it's like a master slave, right? Exactly. Sorry, um, sorry, sorry. If you are telling if two masters are there, one master will only take the request and uh, asynchronous. No, both will take. Request. Both will take. Both will take. But I mean, this can be configured in such a way that both can take and only one could also take. With uh, a single, one... slave, single master and slave, you have to manually intervene yourself and promote slave to master. But when you are using hot standby, that guy okay. itself okay. will make ma okay. uh, it for okay. master simply. So, so selection of leader when a leader goes down is faster when you have such yes. configuration. Okay. Mm. okay. And but, I think multi leader also. Oh, yeah. Go ahead, Shashank. No, I'm saying, but when you said that only one master will take another, I mean, to the other, it will be replicated, right? So that's again a master slave, typical master slave, right? True. No, but he's yeah. still a master. Yeah, yeah. He, yeah, yeah, master. yeah, yeah. It's master. still a master. It can promote itself to be yes, a master. master. You don't need to yeah. intervene. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm. Got that. Yeah, and also I've seen... slight see... difference there, subtle difference, yeah. 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 Slight yeah. Difference. The multi-leader hmm. comes in when probably we have, uh, you know, different uh, database servers on different geographic locations and you want to reduce the latencies. That's when you have multi-leader conflicts. Yeah. yeah, so we can address that question when someone was talking about earlier, right? Yeah, so it's it's not going to be solved that way, but at least to some extent, yeah. I sense. have one question here, Santosh. Mm -hmm. So after the challenge is over, so is there any cron job uh, which is processing the score, uh, iterating over the entire database? How would? would yeah, that is actually for the leader leader board. Some cron job should run and actually get the uh, results. That is what I'm thinking. Okay. Yeah, it has to happen, right? If the event happens, then some something has. So to it will iterate through all the submissions of a user. Is by the way, is there any capping on number of submissions that a user can make? uh no not really time but time. uh really required yeah time maybe time even time. if he does it because if you rate limit for him to submit any submission of for a minute something mm -hmm. like that so he can make maximum in an hour maybe 60 submissions so that might not be more or maybe even if he makes every second 60 into 3600 so that should be fine right i'm just thinking loud okay Right. Now that would be like then uh, intentionally somebody is trying to uh, make the server down. Then only thirty six hundred submissions you can make. Yeah. Right? So you we can stop that. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. So I think that should be a rate limiter, right? Otherwise, it yeah, would be yeah. like That's unnecessary. Right. Thing. Yeah. Correct. So yeah. I have so, a question regarding caching. Like when you talk about caching, like oh, what kind of uh, like uh, cache can we use? Uh, uh, on and it is applicable with our Redis and Memcache. So, like, so I I would think uh, Redis should be okay, isn't it? We don't need um, more specializations in that. So Redis is actually highly available. Like uh, Memcache is not like that high, not highly available. Uh, according to my understanding. Yeah, it's, it, I mean, it's like a distributed cache, right? And it's highly available. And it, it's yeah, an both, both are distributed cache, isn't it? Uh -huh. But memcache has some something more than Redis. I'm not very clear about that. I think Redis has queue, stack, priority queue, all these options also. Okay. Same, I think there also you have in memcache. Okay. No, well, not by default. Mm -hmm. They are libraries that are on top of, basically it's so, string only. So if you're going to do request level caching, then memcache will be much faster and also distributed. But uh, if you have to store key value, something, or maybe using some data structure, the Redis is a more good option, I would say. Mm -hmm. For key value, Redis is better, right? JSON format, yeah. Okay. Okay, so now, as we said, the last, uh, the cron job actually can run this query for the leaderboard, you know, and then get all the results. 
and then it can actually put that in a cache and the other user can keep on accessing it. Uh, so if you now let's cover other two uh, small topics, what they said about code execution layer. And I think we did talk about it more user containers on machine with high CPU. So that is what the containers will be. They don't consume too many resources. They will have appropriate privileges and there will be a time limit set for each of these execution. So we get a time limit exceeded and all this stuff. And this is, they talk about the plagiarism checks, you know? So whenever, how do you detect that? So whenever we are done with this whole um, uh, contest, we'll go through all the codes, submitted solutions and take actions based on that. And they, they talk about some soft, special softwares, which are very good at that. I think they, it's the MOSS, that is one which uh, can actually Stanford, the post mm -hmm. Stanford has developed one NLP software which is used for checking the plagiarism. Okay, yeah. So this is also one one thing we need to do uh, in our OJs. So it is uh, at least it completes the requirement to some extent. Okay, and this was the reference article I was referring to, but I was going to some other stuff also around that. And I'll share all of this stuff in our Discord channel. Anyone has any other questions before we wrap? Hey, uh, I wanted to request if we discuss related to, you know, uh, having our user base split across regions.